This podcast represents my opinions and the opinions of my guests. This is not medical advice, and I'm not establishing a physician-patient relationship with any listener. The content here should not be taken as medical advice. The content here is for informational purposes only, and because each person is so unique, please consult with your healthcare professional for any medical questions that you may have. Welcome, welcome, everyone. We're here for another episode of the Not Your Doc podcast. Thank you for joining us. Um, I'm your host, Vanessa, and we're here again with Dr. Tadros. What's up, Dr. Tadros? Hey, welcome back. Thank you for uh, for hanging out with me one more time. Yeah, well, we'll do more than this. I haven't gotten tired of you yet. Well, good. It's been all right. It's fun. You, we talk, uh, Seth, our producer, and Vanessa and I talk every time that we, we enjoy it. Yeah. I think I'd lead the conversation say, don't you enjoy it? I'm like, yes. <laughs> we'll say, sure. Yeah, why not? Yeah, Doc. No. <laughs> no, it's it's awesome. Um and I'm really, I mean, I'm always excited about what we're going to talk about, but I'm particularly excited about this one because it like, it makes me a little bit uncomfortable mm-hmm. and I kind of like that a little bit. Okay. Um, Discomfort is fine. <laughs> so basically we're, we're going to hit on a social issue today that I think mm-hmm. um, many of us would prefer to ignore. Like, for sure, prefer to ignore if we were really honest about unless, it. Unless you were one of my patients and then you, it was never ignored. Right. Um, and that issue is alcohol. Yes. So um, drinking is such a deeply ingrained part of our culture as Americans. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's so deeply ingrained, I think, that like many of us would only consider like drinking less or giving up alcohol completely if we thought we had like a capital P problem with it, right? Yeah, you wish. Like a DUI, a violent outburst, you know, b- crazy blackout or something. Mm-hmm. Um, and sometimes it seems like in our society, there's kind of two camps of people in, in the U.S., you know, people who never drink, yes, you know, because they're either in recovery or they come from a religious or cultural background where drinking wasn't really condoned. That's right. And then there's the rest of us who can find an occasion and a reason to drink basically anywhere we look. Yes. Um, so I'm kind of, I'm I'm sort of representing that second camp there. All um, right. We'll I'm, take it. I'm a fan of alcohol. I enjoy alcohol. Um, I'm from a big Italian family. We love to eat and drink together. And I've lived in St. Louis pretty much my entire life. So mm-hmm. Drinking alcohol here is very much a part of our culture. We drink at weddings. We drink at graduations. We drink at first communions. We That's drink right. at funerals. You got them. We drink at family dinners, sporting events, kids' birthday parties. We drink with others, and we drink alone. Mm-hmm. We drink to unwind from a hard day at work. That's right. To uh, celebrate an achievement or a special event, we drink to relieve stress, to help us sleep. We drink when we're happy. We drink when we're sad. We drink when we're bored. We drink when we're lonely. That's right. I think I've had alcohol in every single one of these situations. And like all of and they're all situations that are like, are like totally normalized for alcohol consumption in America. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm sure there's like, you know, like regional and economic variance with like how much people actually drink. But we for the most part, we drink a lot in America and we don't really think about it that much. You know, so. you're absolutely right. And, you know, as a, as a physician for for practically three decades, um, I will tell you. I repeated myself so much in, on a lot of chronic conditions, and one of them was alcohol consumption. Mm. Um, the first problem is that people don't understand wh- how how they got to a point where the doc is actually interested enough to, to, to ask about it and then persist after you give them what seems to be a reasonable answer uh, why, yeah. the, why the doc <laughs> keeps pressing on. Um, well, first of all, are we trying to make everyone turn off the podcast today? I'm just like wondering from the outset, like if that's our goal. No, it it is not. (laughs) You know, I want people, adults and uh, to, to be well informed. Yeah. Um, and I also want them to not only be well informed from evidence-based, um, information, but also from, uh, to consider some of our experiences, my experience specifically, uh, taking care of patients, uh, with all sorts of conditions, not just alcohol, uh, related issues. There's there's no patient that I see that just has one issue, one problem, one health one health concern, one health prevention. Um, so part of any good internal medicine or primary care uh, uh, 
intake for a new patient is family history and, and medications and, and uh, substance use history. Mm-hmm. Um, and that includes nicotine in the form of typical tobacco, it could be chewing tobacco, uh, it could be uh, vaping, et cetera. But the other, and illicit drugs, um, but one of them is alcohol. And um, and so we define a, a, a standard drink. And uh, this is alcohol. We're going to talk about all types of alcohol. This is uh, wines, wine coolers, uh, mixed drinks, spirits, uh, hard, also hard. No one drinks hard wine coolers anymore, Dr. Tetros. Uh, They're called you know, seltzers. Seltzers, yeah. Seltza. Th- thank you for advertising <laughs> and marketing. Uh, and and uh, so and beer and uh, so um, and I even say stuff you make in the basement. Uh, so some people are, are love their, wa- their make their own wine or their own beer. Um, and like you said, uh, it, it's it, there is probably not an occasion in the United States, in Western culture mm-hmm. <clears throat> that you can't have an excuse for alcohol. Um, um, and it's so much. Uh, sometimes there's so much of the culture of what people are born into and. Raised that it's uh, I'm the foreign I'm the I'm the weird one to question the, how much they drink or why they drink or right. etc. I'm the weird one because they they've done it for decades um, and they feel like they don't have any abnormal effects. <clears throat> uh, a, a drink, a standard drink, and we'll come back to that. Uh, we'll talk about a 12 ounce beer uh, that's about five uh, percent alcohol by volume. It's uh, eight ounces of uh, malt liquor, if you, you like a uh, Colt 45s. Um, and it's five ounces of wine. And typical wine, in this case, would be 12, 12%. And then uh, one and a half ounces of hard, hard liquor. So that's kind of a standard drink because, as you know, People have big pores. If some people have no pores, they just kind of ch- you know chug along it, and there's no there's no actually. It's like me eating ice cream out of the uh, original container. I don't mm-hmm. I don't I yeah don't, not I, measured right, not <laughs> zero measure. Uh, it's only whenever I feel good about it that I stop eating. Um, but in this case, this is the, the challenge. This is one of the first challenges we run into. People have no concept of how much alcohol they drink by volume. Yeah. Um, and because they say, well, I just drink beer, I don't drink hard liquor, mm-hmm. they think somehow it's safer, it's less destructive, et cetera, and it's not. Mm-hmm. Uh, alcohol has been associated with, and I, I have this on my on my blog, alcohol has been associated with everything, and this is even my own practices, stuff that I've, and, and this is all written up, low mood. And this is either exacerbates or causes problems, causes mm. problems or actually makes it worse. Low mood, like depression, anxiety, marital problems, irritability and anger, motivation problems, headaches, malaise and fatigue, erectile dysfunctions, weight gain, insomnia, where you pop awake uh, too early in the morning or you frequently wake throughout the, uh, throughout the night, heartburn, uh, High blood pressure, snoring, sleep apnea, where you stop breathing at night and don't realize it. Atrial fibrillation, it's an irregular heartbeat that can cause uh, strokes. Elevated blood sugars, prediabetes as well as real diabetes. Elevated triglycerides, elevated liver numbers, pancreas inflammation, pancreatitis. Peripheral nerve uh, problems, iron deficiencies. Uh, It can coexist or be a gateway to other addictions. Uh, It can interact with your drugs, uh, your prescription medications. And the big thing that people don't know, a lot of physicians don't talk about, cancers. And it's been shown to uh, uh, correlate and, 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 and be causative agent for oral ca- some oral cancers. Pharyngeal, that's the back of the throat. Uh, laryngeal, that's your voice box. Esophagus, liver, colon and rectum, and breast. People don't realize that for women especially... <clears throat> Men do get breast cancer at a very low rate, but uh, that breast cancer is one of the problems. So if they, they, don't, they don't have a family history of breast cancer, they never smoked, but they get breast cancer uh, at a relatively young age, uh, that uh, one of, the, one of the, fa- the risk factors is alcohol consumption. Mm-hmm. And it, when you say alcohol consumption here, mm-hmm. are we talking about any alcohol consumption yes. or are we talking about like too much alcohol consumption? Right. So we'll come to that. There's a Lancet article that came out a few years ago, I believe in 2018, that looked back uh, retrospective. There's probably, believe it or not, there's probably no safe level of alcohol use uh, that, to, that, that does not trigger something in terms of the stuff I've listed. Wow. So that's, so it's not practical. We're not going to stop drinking uh, for uh, most of us, uh, uh, except for certain situations. Uh, like you said, religious and, and health. Or some people have to have a total abstinence. Mm-hmm. But a lot of it needs to, I believe, people need to understand the list of stuff that I think about whenever I see a patient who's got balance problems or sleep problems or mood or marital problems. Uh, almost always, 
uh, I'll, uh, always I'll ask about alcohol. A large chunk of those patients will have alcohol that may have contributed or caused it to begin with or contributed to make it worse. Mm. Uh, so we stopped the cancers. Balance problems, bleeds in the head, brain shrinkage, heart enlargement, uh, memory issues, et cetera. So that's, uh, you know, I, I went on for several minutes there just listing this stuff uh, related to alcohol and, and some, of its, uh, some, some of its physical and psychological effects. Um, wow. So th that's kind of where I start as a physician. <clears throat> I, because I, as a primary care physician, I'm the one that takes the blood pressure, typically myself. I'm the one that uh, orders the blood test and sees it back. I'm the one that uh, looks at the weight and the body mass index of BMI. I'm the one, <clears throat> I'm usually the first stop for their complaints about erectile problems and sleep issues and snoring and, mm -hmm. and irritability and, and anger stuff and, and headaches. So I'm usually the first one that stops. And I, that's and almost all of these people, uh, 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 I'm sorry, almost everybody I should be asking alcohol questions. No, a large percentage of alcohol does contribute to uh, their issue. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I, I think one of the major things that we struggle with is sort of defining what excessive alcohol use is, yes. right? And um, so we're, we're actually going to reference this really great infographic put out by the CDC. They don't get everything right, but this is a helpful infographic Yes. Um, called What is Excessive Alcohol Use? We're going to have a link to this in the podcast description, of course, so that you can take a look yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and we're going to kind of walk us through this, Dr. Tadros. Yeah, it's uh, it's a pie chart, and it says, uh, and uh, there are four regions, four areas, uh, four fields uh, that we should consider excessive alcohol use. Uh, anybody, any use of alcohol by pregnant women is considered excessive. Uh, the next one is binge drinking, and this is what we typically see in, in, in teenagers and people in high school and college. Uh, they don't drink every day. They don't drink in moderation. They try to get buzzed as fast as possible. Um, so I think that it's important to say that we're we're gonna get into defining what binge mm -hmm. drinking is, but I think it is it's not just college students That's and right. high schoolers that are doing this. It like there. when you actually realize like how mm -hmm. little sort of like relative to what we think is a normal amount to drink, like how mm -hmm. little actually counts as binge drinking, mm -hmm. like there are many adults who are habitually doing this, That's you know, multiple times per week. It starts, I should clarify, yeah. it starts in our youth, sure. and some people never turn it off. That's correct. Yeah. Um, and then so we, we so uh, excessive drinking, so any, any woman who's pregnant, uh, binge drinking will come back, like you said. Any alcohol use under age 21 is considered underage drinking, which is in the excessive drinking category. And then heavy drinking, and we'll, uh, with binge drinking, we'll kind of define that too. Yeah, absolutely. And by the way, this is, uh, I think they're pretty liberal when we're going to go over these quantities. I think they're pretty liberal. As a physician, I see it much, much less uh, uh, effects to the body and mental health and relationships at much less volume than what we're going to describe here from the CDC, mm. from the Center of Disease Control. Yeah, so it looks like it defines heavy drinking as for women, eight drinks or more per week. And then for men, f heavy drinking is 15 drinks or more per week. That's right. Um, so it's about a drink a night, and this is a standard drink. We'll come back to that. Mm -hmm. It's a standard drink for women for seven days a week and two standard uh, standard drink per night for women seven days a week and a, a two standard drinks uh, per night or per day for, for men. Uh, so that's that's considered excessive. Yep. And I would argue that much, much less than that, I will, uh, I will see triglyceride problems and weight problems, et cetera. Right, exactly. We said before that those... That long list of conditions mm -hmm. that can either be caused by or exacerbated by alcohol is not just with excessive drinking, it's even with moderate or mild amounts of, of drinking. That's correct. So um, now we're gonna we're gonna talk more in detail about what what is considered a drink. Dr. Tadros kind of referenced this before. I'm actually gonna give us kind of like a St. Louis trans translation yes. of what these what these actually turn into because I think like it says eight ounces of 7% malt liquor. Like, no one is drinking Colt 45 anymore, Dr. Tadros. Oh I gosh. love you very I'm, much, but I've, it's not, I've shown my age. not the case. Maybe where I hung, <laughs> out, maybe where I hung out. So, um, okay, so it starts with 12 ounces of a 5% ABV beer. So that's a can of beer. A can of, of Budweiser is 5%. So that would be one drink. That's right. Well, 
maybe you drink a pint on draft like you get a you have a draft beer That's right. so 16 ounces is actually 1.3 drinks mm-hmm. so maybe you have four pints when you go out with your buddies that that's equal to 5.2 drinks that's not right. not four beers that's right so and, and the standard drink is not by body weight and it's important right. we come back to don't confuse like well i'm bigger therefore i can handle more exactly. therefore this this is what i drink right. or I, I don't feel buzzed or high mm-hmm. that's not a drink so it's really by volume that's what abv stands for for alcohol, sure alcohol, alcohol by volume. volume yeah um okay so malt malt liquor we're gonna get into the you know the the modern definition of malt of malt liquor is basically anything with a seven percent abv or higher so if you like a you know a heady ipa if you like some of these big fat sours that are out there that are delicious um those have much higher alcohol content so mm-hmm. a 12 ounce pour of an IPA, so a can size serving of an IPA would be one and a half drinks. That's right. A pint of one of those higher ABV uh, beers is going to be two drinks. Mm-hmm. So say you like to have three pints of a strong IPA when you go out, yeah. that's six drinks yep. in terms of how the CDC measures it, how our healthcare professionals define it. So, I mean, for me to think about it in those terms makes me realize like, okay, like, I can easily put away this much. Like yes. that's not, it's not even that hard to get to that. That's right. Um, so same thing with wine, like uh, five, you know, five ounces, a five ounce pour counts as, you know, uh, you know a, a glass of wine, one serving. If you think about a typical bottle, there's about five glasses per bottle. Some people call it four and that's where we get into trouble. Exactly. <laughs> so what's your typical pour? If you open a bottle of wine at home and you're going to have a couple of glasses while you're you know, hanging out for the night or, you know, just to unwind or whatever, are you drinking half a bottle or you're drinking three quarters of a bottle? Because if they're, if the CDC says there are five glasses in that bottle, then maybe you're having three drinks per night for your two glasses. Absolutely. Um, and then last, of course, is the, you know, the distilled spirits, which is a little bit more straightforward. Like a regular shot glass is going to be an ounce and a half. We have a regular shot that's going to count as one drink. That's right. But if you have mixed drinks, a, you know, like a, a, a little, like a highball serving at mm-hmm. a bar. If you go to a nice bar, you get a mixed drink made with whiskey. They're going to use one and a half ounces, and that's going to be one drink right there. That's right. If you mix it at home or at a party, and you just, you know, oh, three or four fingers of whiskey, and then whatever my mixer is, you might be having three, four servings worth of alcohol in that one drink. Yeah. So I think starting with a better awareness of how much we're actually drinking right. and how that translates to what to the ways that our healthcare providers are thinking about our drinking, I think is a really important first step. And I took a like a I took off like a bat out of H E double hockey stick <laughs> uh, talking about this. This is not bad people. Yeah, this no, is, of course these not. These are people that slipped into these um these habits accidentally or young people who don't know any better um and uh and uh, uh, and what people will consider they call it normal normal young uh, youngster behavior is not normal it's maybe common and co- certainly common in certain communities sure. but it's not normal yeah. not everybody drinks and not everybody drinks to excess um so uh, let's talk about what binge drinking is uh so uh yeah we talked we talked about uh, heavy drinkers that's more than uh it's eight eight drinks or more so it's uh, uh more than one drink per night for women mm. uh for uh, per uh, per week and then for men it's two drinks uh, per night for men uh well, that's heavy more. drinking right? it's yeah, considered okay. heavy well, drinking yeah. uh-huh. so binge drinking is uh, is considered within a two or three hour period so that's okay. a binge so it's kind of a, a large amount of volume in a short amount of time um, dollar long necks on Wednesdays or Fridays or whatever's like that. So that's why they entice you. They entice you to hurry up and drink within a certain like happy hour, certain yeah. period for a low amount of money. And hopefully you'll stay there and keep drinking and, and eating. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but like once again, like we say high, high amount of volume. So yes. like high amount of volume by this definition is could nothing. still be four pints. That's right. Which you could easily put away if you're having one pint per quarter of the football game that you're watching That's spread right. out spread out over a couple of hours so like i i think sometimes binge drinking gets this like um added definition of you have to be like totally like three sheets to the wind right. out of control yeah, totally vomiting soused, blacked, blacked out, out right. like that is not what this no. means this is about volume of alcohol right 
Wow. It's not about it's not about how, how what the effect is on you right. in terms of how you feel or how you stagger right. or et cetera. So for women, once again, because on average, this is why women are uh, have less volume allowed uh, than men. Am, on average, women are 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 are, are uh, more petite, are, are lighter in total body mass. Uh, so that's the first thing, and uh, and uh, their alcohol dehydrogenase. This is uh, the the enzyme that breaks down alcohol in your gut mm. uh, may not be as effective. So uh, women. Uh, can uh, can't get away with as much volume as men for those two big reasons uh, on average of body mass and also their their breakdown enzymes. So for women, binge drinking within two or three hours, four four or more drinks. Uh, so and for men, it's five or more drinks. Mm. So like you said, uh, if you if you measure it, uh, it's not uh, if you measure it the way that the CDC wants it. And typically, when they do research, this is the typical research volumes yeah. and percent alcohols. That's, that's how they can compare apples to apples right. between research projects. I compare thinking thinking about this like to, you know, kind of how they teach you to measure like portion control with foods. You yeah. know, we say like, a you know, your, um, your protein should be the size of your palm and that you should have like a fist sized serving of, you know, uh-huh. vegetables, multiple servings like that. Like we need new we need new ways to visualize how how much we're we're actually consuming right yeah um i mean it used to be 12 a 12 pack you know a six pack 12 pack and, and a case and i years ago i realized some cases are 30 you know they're, they're oh they're, sure they're, they're yeah. 30 and uh so whenever i say a case uh, we were not the patients and i were not talking the same language yeah for, for sure and i th- and i think especially what's served at restaurants too with draft beers like right. you can easily t- have so much more the alcohol contents are a lot higher um, and a lot of this, like just like you said, you know, these were um, many people can drink like these amounts of alcohol and not have major problems in their life. Mm-hmm. Um, it may not cause, you know, legal problems or marital problems or, you know, rise to um, even an addiction or dependence. Yep, we'll get to that. Yes. You're um, right. But it's still problematic. Yes. And we're going to talk more about why. That's right. Um, the, uh, when 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 patients uh, when people um, uh, drink, certainly people will say, "Well, I, I eat when I drink," or mm-hmm. the Europeans drink and they they have less heart attacks than the Americans. Mm-hmm. So they find all sorts of reasons and excuses and stuff that's been touted, even from the medical literature. Um, and certainly, whenever you eat, it slows down your alcohol absorption, so your blood alcohol level, uh, especially you know, unless right. you're overpowering it, you keep drinking way beyond your eating, your blood alcohol level will be will slow down in terms of the rise of blood alcohol. There's no doubt about it. If you're eating fatty, fatty meals and protein, especially, um, uh, when we talk about the health benefits, and this confuses a lot of people. Mm. Um, this is a Lancet article that I said came out, I believe, in 2018, that there's no self, uh, safe level that they could find some problem. Uh, with any amount of alcohol, even to drink a, a year, but certainly that's not practical for the vast majority of us. Uh, mm. So that so I just want to point that out because people uh, sometimes say, "Well, I never knew. I would have changed my mind right. if I if I had known. Only if I had known." Um, so so we we want to uh, people to become more more aware, and right. that's the first step yeah. is awareness to even know that alcohol. Can cause can can cause cancer, can cause medical problems, etc. And that they're that the way that they measure their drinks is not the standard way because of, in America, especially we supersize everything, mm-hmm. uh, even if we don't call it supersized. Um, so uh, and just just the awareness, so that whenever they do start having weight gain or they're having uh, problems with uh, with uh, <clears throat> with. Uh, uh, blood pressure and other things that sometimes they don't they're not aware of because mm-hmm. you have to have somebody else check it for you oftentimes your liver numbers etc oftentimes you have to have an order in order to go get to the lab to mm-hmm. get it checked um, etc um, and I find a lot of physicians nurse practitioners etc either don't know enough about alcohol to 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 to, to discuss it openly uh, number two they don't ask questions if they do know something about it, they forget to ask because they're in a hurry and, and it's not their visit is for for blood pressure check or something else or depression it's not necessarily yeah. focused on alcohol uh, number number three the people want would normally discuss it but they want to stay on schedule and any discussion about something chronic like this where it's alcohol chronic use or heavy use or binge use or dependency we'll still get into that mm-hmm. uh, uh, then it's a, it's a much longer discussion and uh, and a lot of 
practitioners don't feel like they 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 have enough knowledge about the longer discussion, don't know what to tell the person after they discuss it, what to do next, um, or just throws them off their schedule. Uh, so that's that's the uh, the other reason. So that's the reason why I'm sometimes the physician. Whenever they have several other practitioners that look after them for different conditions, I'm the one that brings it up. They may see the neurologist and the endocrinologist and the urologist and mm. stuff, and I'm the one that tends to uh, tends to bring it up. Once again, maybe another physician or Why nurse practitioner. Why do you think that is? They may have brought it up. Other people may have, but they would have just done it on the fly. Mm. Said, oh, your alcohol consumption? Wow, that's a, that's quite a bit. And then move on. Mm. And it's up to a person like me to be persistent. Mm. Uh, but then I become the heavy. And they tend to, uh, if they don't want to hear it, et cetera, mm. um, then I become the one that they want to avoid. Or next time they come, they don't want to talk about it. And, so, and they're thankful that I don't bring it up every single time. Yeah. Um, they're adults. Uh, as long as I don't believe somebody's totally impaired in the office, I believe that they'll remember. Mm-hmm. I will give them information. I'll write it down. If they have a loved one with them, oftentimes they'll, co- they'll cohere. They'll be listening while the patient's in the room. Uh, they'll be listening uh, with me. Um, the other piece that I want to ta- tell, we talk about all the positive stuff. We, we it's, it's with Finish, you know, uh, you know, working in the yard or barbecuing or, or vacation or weekends at the lake or et cetera. Um, a lot of times alcohol is a, s- a way to self-medicate. Mm-hmm. And right. so there's a whole group of people that are self-medicate. It's not either or, it's and. Uh, it's a whole group of people that self-medicate because of previous history of trauma, mm. because of the depression, because of their anxiety, because of insomnia. Stress. Uh, stress, uh, marital issues. So they self-medicate. This is You don't have to go to the doctor to reach for a beer to unwind. Mm-hmm. Alcohol is an, is an excellent way, but comes at great cost, uh, as, uh, to relax. So uh, you don't have to have Xanax. You don't have to have. You don't have to exercise. You don't have to meditate. You know, within a within a few. You know, within within a, a can or two, you can be quite relaxed. Um, so people can self medicate, self treat uh, for 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 the for their tension, uh, uh, for their depression, etc. But it comes at such a great cost because what happens is something called tolerance. Right. So tolerance is um, uh, having requiring more and more of the same product in order to get the same effect. So if it, whenever you if if people have if if, if they're at thirteen they had a couple of sips of their dad's wine they're they're going to be buzzy mm-hmm. uh, within just because they've never had alcohol. But the, the, by the time that you can drink six and twelve beers a week and stuff like that, having a beer or two doesn't make you buzzy anymore. Right. So you have to have three or four, mm-hmm. etc. Same thing happens if you take it as a nightcap. Um, so this is one of the problems we run into is when people drink later in the day, um, it can help them go to sleep, but when, when it was off, you pop awake and you can't get back to sleep. Mm-hmm. So this is another problem we run into. People say, I'm, 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 my responsibilities are done for the day, the kids are down for bed, I'm going to watch TV or I'm going to do this, You know, I'm going to do word puzzle, whatever it is, and I'll have my nightcap or a couple of beers. Uh, what happens is it does help them sleep, but it comes at a great cost mm-hmm. uh, that uh, that uh, increases snoring, increases sleep apnea where they stop breathing and the mm-hmm. tongue fall, obstructive sleep apnea where the tongue fall, falls the, towards the back of the throat um, uh, because they they're... they're uh, sleep is so deep, they they have quite a bit of muscle relaxation. Tongue falls further back, and they tend to stop breathing more. So it's called sleep apnea, obstructive sleep apnea. It tends to worsen that if you're not already on a CPAP or other treatment. Uh, uh, continuous positive airway pressure. Um, and uh, so we, we get into these troubles accidentally uh, because we're trying to make ourselves feel better to reward ourselves right. and stuff like that. We right. accidentally get into it. And then there's tolerance where you need more and more of it to get even any effect anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about um, uh, about dependence and addiction? Sure. Um, you know, several years ago, they went from alcohol abuse, alcohol uh, dependence, alcoholism, uh, 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 all these different terms to one overall arching is called uh, alcohol use disorder, AUD. Mm-hmm. Um, and under AUD is all, all the old terms. But when we talk to somebody who's dependent, so they become physically and psychologically dependent. Physical dependence is means that that if you take it away suddenly, some people can have withdrawals. So this is the uh, tardive, uh, uh, t- uh, this is the shakes. Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, so they have withdrawals. Some of these people get sweats. They get hypertension. They get uh, nausea. They get vomiting. They get irritable. Can't sleep. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, blood pressure rises. Um, and uh, they can have seizures and die. Mm. So those are severe shakes. And yeah. the, 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 the most severe uh, of the withdrawals 
uh, our uh, DTs, DTs mm -hmm. uh, delirium, delirium tremens. Yeah, tremens. The most severe is within 72 hours. Mm -hmm. So whenever somebody uh, runs out of, you know, if a kid's binge drinking and they run out of money or stuff like that, or somebody, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, doesn't have somebody looking after them, these people, whenever they, su or they, they suddenly stop, uh, what what will happen is uh, a small number of these people will go within seventy two hours will can have seizures and die. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I myself, we had we had Mrs. Early in my practice thirty years ago. We had somebody that would show up several times a year, shakes and sweats and and fevers and liver numbers elevated. We admitted him several times for all the for all sorts of workups for infection and, and autoimmune disease. It turns out that he wasn't telling his family that he was drinking, that he would stop. He'd get mm. disgusted, tired mm. or something. Mm. Mm. He'd stop mm. and he'd come in, in, in with, the, with the shakes. And uh, and we looked like medical uh, medical emergencies. And DTs are a medical er emergency For because sure. these people need to be put on some sort of benzodiazepine and weaned off that way. That's mm -hmm. the typical way to do it. Fortunately, the, the highest risk for seizures are within the first 72 hours. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not at the 72nd hour, but within the 72 hours. Right. Uh, so that's the first thing. The other thing is, so that's a, a, a very important, especially if people are mixing their benzodiazepines, their Ambien, their Xanax, their Ativan, yeah. their, their, their Clonopin, if they're mixing it with alcohol, uh, that's a humongous, humongous, humongous problem in terms of withdrawals and seizures and death. Yeah. Uh, so both alcohol and benzos are d depressed brain activity. So when you take them off suddenly, they stop them suddenly. Uh, you have hyper hyper excitable brain, which is part of really what what the seizures look uh, are. Yeah. Uh, so it's uh, it, these people get tired of of of, of or they or they or they for, they forget to take their Xanax or whatever, mm -hmm. and they withdraw mm -hmm. and they don't realize what happens and they end up in the emergency room. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so yeah, I I should say too that like withdrawal from alcohol. If you if you're curious what that feels like, if you've ever had a hangover, yes, that's what's going on in your body to a lesser extent Much than someone lesser. going through you know, uh, intensive al alcohol withdrawal That's after right. being, uh, you know, chronically dependent on it. Right. But it, it's sort of the same progression of symptoms, if you will. So dependence is physical and psychological, in this case, physical and psychological. Uh, so the physical is this withdrawal. The physical withdrawal, like I mentioned, is the most severe cases, the DTs. Um, uh, and then uh, the psychological withdrawal is the cravings. Uh, mm -hmm. So these people start missing it. And uh, what you don't, what people recognize in AA and elsewhere is that that's why they have to have support. Is that uh, sometimes cravings can go on for years. Yeah. Um, and so some of these people, a lot of these people, need to be on medications. There are a couple of medications to potentially help to decrease cravings, mm -hmm. recidivism, or relapse back to using alcohol. Mm -hmm. uh, so once you're through with the physical uh, symptomatology, the first few days, et cetera, that's pretty safe you're pretty good it's the psychological issue the addictive behaviors the addictions mm -hmm. the obsessiveness um and the cravings those are the very tough uh, uh bear to wrestle here yeah and i think of course you know people who are who are using alcohol to self-medicate even if they're not consciously aware that they're self-medicating right if you remove that medication the thing that you were trying to medicate is naturally going to flare back up. That's right. So if it's your depression, if it's your anxiety, if it's your stress, if it's like your inability to sleep, whatever it is that you're right. trying to mitigate with the alcohol, that's mm -hmm. going to intensify when you remove right. the treatment. And not only intensify, they kind of have a super rebound. They, yeah. they don't go back to their usual insomnia or usual flashbacks from PTSD or usual uh, depression. They go super bad yeah. and sometimes for weeks afterwards mm -hmm. before it comes back. Before, uh, and if you continue staying off alcohol, then the, then those um, symptoms and signs of symptoms tend to get better. But, uh, but that's why... You, People need it's called dual diagnosis. They mm -hmm. have they have an addiction, and in this case, alcohol plus a, psych, a depressive or anxiety disorder. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think it's important to point out. It's almost like so be, because you can have that super rebound. Alcohol is almost like an accelerant mm -hmm. on some of those things. That's right. Like if if we if we could r remove alcohol as a self medication tool from from the beginning and just choose to deal with the the trauma, the PTSD, the anxiety, depression, and treat it mm -hmm. with, you know, good therapy, medications, all that kind of support, you're going to be better off doing that right. than trying to self-medicate with alcohol first, right. having to remove that, having the extra right. kickback. Double work. Right? Yeah. I, right. I hadn't really thought about it that way. That's interesting. And by the way, all sorts of people, this is bipolars are increased risk for alcohol abuse. Uh, ADHD are increased risk of alcohol mm. abuse. Uh, depression, anxiety, um, uh, 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 
obsessiveness, mm-hmm. uh, obsessive people are almost all of them are increased risk of alcohol abuse, um, right. uh, misuse and uh, abuse. Uh, so it, it's important to, first of all, recognize it. And this is, I would argue that everybody who drinks, I don't care if it's once a year, to review it. Because even once a year, if you have a blackout, that's a problem. Yeah. So you say, I only drink once a year, you know, on my birthday or whatever. The answer is, is uh, that's, that may be actually a significant problem. I had a, uh, he was a college student uh, who had high triglycerides, had gained weight after since high school and stuff like that, a former wrestler uh, in high school. And uh, <clears throat> I was following him for his weight and he would come in from college, I'd see him. Um, and his triglycerides were running high. The triglycerides are made from from sugar, uh, sugar plus fats, mm-hmm. and so sugar in this case, uh, in his case, uh, was uh, alcohol. was uh, was alcohol plus foods. And uh, normally we'd see him like twelve hours out fasting, so we could check blood levels, blood sugars, blood sugars, and blood cholesterol. Twelve hours. So he came in fasting twelve hours, and his triglycerides were six hundred, almost less than one hundred and fifty wow. milligrams per deciliter. Wow. So six hundred. I'm like, holy crap! What happened? Well, he says, well, I was drinking until the twelve hour mark, and then I was then no, no drinks. So I had him not drink for a couple of days, and do it, and it was closer to three half that much, about three hundred, still high. Uh, but but just even twelve hour fast mm-hmm. from everything from food and, and alcohol, mm-hmm. his triglycerides were still six hundred when normal his normal baseline is three hundred. Yeah, it's not normal, but his baseline was three hundred milligrams per deciliter. So that's how dramatic. That's how that's how. And these people, whenever you some of these people, whenever they have high triglycerides from alcohol or elsewhere, you spin down their blood. Instead of having the blood settle to the bottom of the blood cells and some kind of clearish yellowish stuff on top of the serum, it's milky. It looks literally like milk. And it's because how, much, how high the triglycerides. And some of these people, not all everybody, uh, have high triglycerides because of alcohol-related uh, uh, use. Some of it's chronic and some of it's uh, acute. So with, without getting like too much in the weeds on the chemistry of how this works, like. Sure. When I think about a uh, you know a Bud Select, for example, it's probably you know twelve ounce can of Bud Select, probably four point five or four point two percent ABV, mm-hmm. hundred calories, mm-hmm. zero grams of fat, mm-hmm. clo- close to low a low amount of carbs, not mm-hmm. a crazy amount of carbs. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. How how can something like that increase the lipids in my blood, the fats sure. in my blood and body? Yeah, so uh, alcohol seems to be metabolic, even though it's a, it's a so remember, al- all alcohol is made out of some sort of starch that where you put a, a ferment, which is a, which is a yeast, and take away oxygen, mm-hmm. and you ferment it. If with oxygen, it oxidizes and turns vinegar. But if you ferment it, so you take away oxygen, sometimes put in carbon dioxide with yeast, with some sort of starch. It could be rice, could be potato, potato starch, rice starch, corn. Uh, barley, all these are, are starches. Um, uh, that's how you form alcohol. The body tends to treat alcohol uh, 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 more like like a fat than the, than a starch. It's uh, for, mm. per gram. It tends to, if I remember correctly, from 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 pre med, uh, it's uh, it's it tends to treat it. I think it's like seven uh, calories per gram, kilocalories or calories, big C calories or kilocalories, small C calories uh, per gram. Whereas uh, starch is like four uh, four, uh, four uh, grams um, mm-hmm. of. Uh, 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 Four, uh, four calories, four calories per, per gram. gram. Thank you. And fat and is ten fast, calories uh, per gram. Right? Fat is about yeah. uh, nine or ten. Yeah. So, so that's for one of the uh, problems. The next thing is um, your liver makes uh, your liver makes uh, the uh, triglycerides. Um, so, a sick liver, whether it's a, a fatty or uh, alcoholic hepatitis or cirrhosis, those mm. are the three stages for alcoholic uh, liver disease. Fatty liver, alcoholic fatty liver disease. Hepatitis this is not viral hepatitis, but alcoholic hepatitis. Hepatitis means alcohol, liver causing liver inflammation. Itis is inflammation, and then cirrhosis, which is permanent scarring that you can't reverse uh, by stopping alcohol. Mm. That's the permanent change. So, uh, so you, if you have a sick liver, it sometimes uh, it has problem, uh, problems making the right type of uh, cholesterol, and fatty molecules, triglyceride molecules. Uh, so that's the next thing. Um, um, and then another thing is, is is pancreas. If the pancreas is very sick, uh, you could have super super high triglycerides, and one of the th- causes for pancreatitis is alcoholic pancreatitis. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that could be the other thing. Um, so that's that's uh, so. Um, and and you could and the great thing about this is if your doctor or your physician or nurse practitioner is very interested, they can check your numbers. They can check after you know the day after you binge drink. They can check it. You know they can check your numbers, uh, the, you know the night of or the mm-hmm. day after. If you want to do a little experiment, I don't want people to get drunk and abuse alcohol just to experiment yeah. on their blood. But <laughs> I think it's important to see what your blood pressure is doing, what your what your lab work is doing. And in this case, I happen to have caught it on twelve hours after a young uh, you know. A, 
20 year old has come to see me the, how much difference the triglycerides were right okay so i i'm thinking i mean you know we you read us a very long list at the beginning of all the mm-hmm. different you know health health and medical conditions that can be affected by alcohol mm-hmm. um as a i'm 32 years old a relatively young person i think a lot of times we i don't worry a whole lot That's about right. uh my cholesterol and my blood pressure and mm-hmm. uh, getting diabetes. Like, I think those are sort of older people problems. It could be, but, but not, not necessarily. But the things that I really worry about are exacerbating my mental health conditions. Yes. And then getting dementia as an old person. Yes. Can you talk about how those two things are affected by alcohol? Yeah. Uh, so certainly an al- alcohol, you know, the first, uh, the first, few sips can, can relax. Uh, so that's the first thing. That's what people tend to want. Mm-hmm. Then after that, you become more tired and sleepy. And then after that, you can become more lethargic. Mm-hmm. After that, you become unarousable. And after that, it's death. And it's not necessarily linear. I make it sound like a little bit and more, more and more, and then, 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 then you die. And the answer is not quite linear, especially if you, uh, if you um, uh, add other drugs to it and, and, and benzos. So that's the first thing. So a lot of people want that relaxed, goofy, loopy, goofy, carefree, yeah. feel funny feeling, mm-hmm. and they'd like to stop there. They're not trying to get drunk and pass mm-hmm. out and stuff like that. So that's what that's what. But unfortunately, most people can't just have two ounces of a wine and, sure. and that, then call it for the night and stuff like that. So that's part of the problem that we run into. Uh, so what happens is, unfortunately, is that it becomes a depressant. So initially, uh, initially it becomes a social lubricant where mm-hmm. you feel funny, you can mm-hmm. talk and laugh and you're less socially conscious uh, uh, about your social um, awkwardness, but then it becomes a depressant. Mm-hmm. And you're, if, you're already, if you're already trying to fight depression, et cetera, um, then that becomes its own problem. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, that's why people with anxiety, why they get on an airplane and start uh, dr- drinking it, yeah. uh, in the old days whenever we could get alcohol in the airplane and COVID, uh, with, before COVID, um, is, is that instead of taking Xanax and trying to, to deal with their anxiety on the airplane uh, or their stress about being bunched in with a bunch of people, they can start drinking. Mm-hmm. And that that is a, is a powerful way to, to decrease anxiety. But the problem is, is that you have tolerance and you need more and more of it to get the same effect to help mm-hmm. your anxiety. And eventually, if you try to cut back or cut it out, you have rebound, severe, severe rebound anxiety right. and insomnia. And so that that's another way that it affects mental health. Um, so yeah, those are the big ways. I think... Um just like from personal experience here, I've been managing my own mental health diagnosis since, you know, I was 16 years or yes. old, 16 years old. Um, I've gone through periods where I've been where I was drinking a lot of alcohol. I've mm-hmm. gone through periods where I've had no alcohol at all. And mm-hmm. I've gone through periods where I was drinking moderately. Mm-hmm. Um, always during the periods of sobriety, no consumption at all. Mm-hmm. I was doing better. Abstinence, yeah. Then, mm-hmm. in the the times and circumstances when I was consuming some or a lot, it's hard. and it's not. I'm not the only one to have that experience. Pretty much everybody else that I know right. who's successfully managing their mental health conditions drink little, infrequently, or never. Yeah. Not to say, not to make any judgments on any nope. of my friends who nope. or anyone else who who nope. likes to drink, but it's just kind of a, a general observation. I, I tell people, you're paying me money. I'm a consultant. You're paying me money to help get you better. You you would fix yourself if you could. Mm-hmm. You're coming to see me because you can't fix yourself or you don't think you can fix yourself. Um, so and then I say, you're going to pay me this much money and we're going to do this to and take these risky medicines. And meanwhile, you're fighting me by smoking too much pot or drinking too much alcohol right. or whatever it is. Right. So I, one of the first things I tell them, part of your response, I'll do my part of, of, of kind of advising you mm-hmm. and testing mm-hmm. and uh, doing the, prescribing the medicines, explaining with the medicines, et cetera, explaining the diagnoses. But I need your part, whether it's you know, waking up on uh, time so that you can exercise, all these other things. Mm-hmm. And alcohol consumption is, is one of the big ones I have to, I have to discuss with people. Um, and sometimes I've cut, I've cut people off from care for me. I say, you know, I love you. I care for you, but I can't continue blah, 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 giving you this medicine. And you keep complaining that mm-hmm. nothing's better. Nothing's yeah. happening. And you keep doing this to your body sure. and you expect me to fix it by throwing more pills at you. Right. I, I think too, again, you know, from personal experience, like the, I wasn't thinking so much at the time about how the drinks I had 
on the weekend was affecting my ability mm. to take care of myself during the week That's a good point. necessarily. You know, you think a hangover wears off in a day and you're fine and you're good to go. But like the, the, the heaviness on your system, that depressant effect on your system mm -hmm. can linger through a lot of things. And it might be the, you know, ha having drinks on the weekend might be the difference between uh, you know, going to the gym or meeting with friends mm -hmm, on mm -hmm. a Wednesday, mm -hmm. um, as opposed to not. Yes. Right. So there, it has, I think, longer term effects on the healthy choices that we make than just immediately after the consumption itself. Yes, that's a good point. Um, and it takes time. If you if you're gonna right. if you you know you could spend several hours. You could be with your kids, or you could be at uh, you know you know in the basement, you know, drinking mm -hmm. three or four beers, watching ESPN. Yeah. So that's 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 the problem. That's the. I mean, there's so many layers that um, that are problem. I, once again, I just want people to recognize: yes, any amount of drinking can be uh, can be an issue for you health wise. Number two, you you, you know that you do drink. Number three. You know, look at the look at the stuff that we've listed here in terms of why we drink and mm -hmm. how and mm -hmm. what a standard drink is and the and and the side effects of potential head to toe side effects of uh, alcohol consumption even moderate uh, etc. Sure. That that right now uh, we there's there there should be no physician uh, that should say start drinking because it's or increase your drinking yeah, because it's me, there's medical and health benefits. Right. So that that's glass a, of red wine is good for your heart. Right. So I, and I know people argue about, well, it's not 18 year olds, it's 68 year olds right. and blah, blah, blah. But the quickie answer is we, the, the, the other list of other side effects uh, that, uh, that are not for, uh, is, uh, is overwhelming. Mm -hmm. uh, so so that, that it overwhelms any potential benefit for your cardiac. Uh, that's what people used to sure. talk to, yeah, yeah. you know, two ounces of right. red, red, red wine. wine. Right. Um, okay, can you, can you talk to us about the scary stuff, dementia? Yeah, so, uh, you know, it turns out that 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 alcohol, you know, they whenever people are you know dr you know sloppy drunk and say they're killing brain cells, and literally it is. It it it, it damages brain cells. So alcohol is a, is actually a toxin. As soon as it gets absorbed through your uh, buccal mucosa through your mouth, it also gets absorbed not through your stomach but through your small intestines. It's immediately sent to your liver. First pass metabolism sends your liver to be tox detoxified, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and uh, the problem. Can we is, say that again. Alcohol is a toxin. It's a toxin. Yeah, a toxic chemical to it your is. brain. You know, it's been around for thousands of years. Uh, and there's reasons why we we've used it for thousands of years. Uh, you know, from religious reasons, um, a bunch of other things. It's not going away. We just need to understand how how it impacts our lives. That we're that. We count in the, those statistics that we listed here uh, that, you know, that we need to check ourselves and make sure, uh, you know, that we haven't slipped into habits, um, uh, et cetera. And this is, includes people who are retired, who now mm -hmm. have more time to drink and can start drinking sure, earlier. Sure. We have people who are, uh, uh, you know, women who have responsibilities have been reduced uh, because their kids are older or, or, their, or their, 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 the, the husband and wife are semi-retired or retired, et cetera. Uh, so that these people, that's what they get, uh, they, you know, whether it's tennis or whether it's just for, for book club or whatever else or, or uh, bunco, uh, these are, you know, oftentimes alcohol is involved in these things. And that's what uh, they slip into it naturally from a social standpoint. Sure. It's not, they're not drinking by themselves in the basement. Uh, so, uh, so that's, so it, once again, we slip into these things and eventually what happens and we, and this is the issue, there's not one person that, that doesn't worry about their memory eventually. Yeah. Whenever they start forgetting, you know, their, 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 their kids, you know, second best friend's name where, where they keep putting their glasses that they keep going by that, you know, that, that, uh, that off ramp and they, you know, they're, they're, you know, they're in their own head, et cetera. Not every one of those things is dementia. Dementia is uh, a chronic condition. Or there's a set of chronic conditions uh, that revolve around uh, worsening memory, worsen, worsening decision-making, executive function. Right. Uh, so that's all the dementias. And the most common one in the United States is called Alzheimer's disease. About 60% of uh, dementias are Alzheimer's, roughly. And there's other ones that are frontotemporal lobe, um, uh, uh, Neiman Picks, or uh, um, uh, um, uh, dementia with Lewy body. Uh, uh, changes mm -hmm. um, uh, and uh, several other ones. Yeah, Quartzfeld, Jakob. Um, so all these are 
uh, issues with respect to memory and executive function, your ability, the big stuff that we do as adults mm -hmm. uh, to make this, to calculations, to make decisions, to follow through on things. Um, and one of the problems that we run into with alcohol is that we can have, with severe alcoholics, we can have, uh, uh, we can have um, uh, Wernicke's encephalopathy uh, uh, and, uh, um, and uh, uh, Korsakoff's. Uh, uh, so well, these are these are these are typically uh, alcohol-related uh, neurologic problems. Uh, one of them is due to low thymine B1 level that can be can be partially reversed. Uh, so some of these are permanent, mm -hmm. and these can go coexist in addition to other dementing processes, so other memory-related issues. Mm -hmm. Uh, but certainly anything that's bad for the brain, whether it's a stroke or head injury or alcohol, is bad in terms of uh, in increases your risk for dementias. Hmm. This I, is what we're dealing with. I'm going to refer to uh, to another little infographic here um, that, again, we'll also put in the description called Six Scary Ways Alcohol Damages the Brain. A couple of headlines on here are, um, number one, that it shrinks the brain. And um, for anybody who's not anyone that has like dementia or Alzheimer's or anything, a, a way that uh, doctors measure the progression of a disease is to to look at the size of the brain, right? To see if there's been shrinkage in the size of the brain. So comparing a CT or an MRI to, from one time period to the next time period. There's right. There's especially for Alzheimer's and other ones, they can look at certain select parts. This is more sometimes more advanced uh, imaging and uh, sometimes research that they can look at certain size of the brain, uh, 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 the thalamus, the amygdala, and tell uh, volume loss in yeah. spe specific areas of the brain. Yeah. Uh, it's probably uh, in general what when for alcoholics let's pretend these are more severe people uh, alcoholics their brain will be smaller than for their age mm -hmm. um, and in fact the brain shrinks away from the from the from the skull the inside of the skull and they're they're bridging vessels uh, they're actually people don't know this uh, uh, physicians do they're bridging vessels between the surface of your brain and the inside of your skull. skull and what happens whenever you get drunk and fall down is your brain gets rattled oh. and it shears it's it shears these vessels and so they end up with subdural hematomas wow. and can potentially die yeah. and stuff like that. This is from drinking, shrunken brain, stretched vessels between the surface of the brain and the inside of the skull, falling or any rapid uh, uh -huh. movement where you like a car accident, slow bleed from the sheared vessels mm -hmm. where they're cut and uh, and end up dying. Um, yeah, and and, and once again, you know, you said that that might that's something that we might see in the brain of an alcoholic. Could we also mm -hmm. that that's something we might see in the brain of someone who that's right. is a heavy drinker, maybe not with a, the that's problematic right. characteristics of alcoholism necessarily, that's but right. just like vo we're talking about volume, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's so alcoholic or alcohol or, or, or people who are alcohol dependent. That's correct. Sure. Yeah, can have this, uh, and and people who are heavy drinkers. That's that's true. They can have. A brain that's shrunken out of proportion for their age. Yeah. So um, a couple of other ones that I'm seeing on here uh, reduces the number of new brain cells, mm -hmm. um, which is t also terrible, mm -hmm. um, and prematurely ages the brain. So the brain of a younger person may function and behave like the brain of an older person because the alcohol is a toxifying agent to the brain, correct? Right. That's correct. Wow. So, I, I mean, just... Those are things I want to avoid, and I wasn't necessarily thinking about and, them. <laughs> and, and some, and a lot of this stuff is irreversible. So dementias, mm. there are a few of them that are reversible. The vast, vast majority of dementias are not reversible, and they tend to be progressive. They tend to get worse as uh, with time. That's the scary stuff. That's right. a, that's a big epidemic inter internationally. Yeah. Uh, as as we grow older, all the dementias, and certainly alcohol contributes to some of that, uh, not all of it, but to some of that. Uh, so I would be curious to know. If there's a correlation between the increase in dementia and the consumption of alcohol in certain societies. I'm sure they've done the studies. I'm not familiar with yeah. that, but I'm sure they're, we probably could look at it. I want to look into that more. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, let's let's talk a little bit about this um, a, a self-assessment because I think a lot of us are like, okay, now we understanding we understand how many drinks there should be. We should not, we understand how much a drink actually is, how to mm -hmm. actually measure a drink. Um, how do we determine if we have something that falls under this umbrella of alcohol use disorder? Yeah, so uh, screening test. The word screening, not screaming, like uh, you know, ah! like, like you know, Halloween. <laughs> but screening test means that um, these are usually simple tests that are cheap, maybe free tests. 
uh, that uh, are done on a at-risk population uh, for select conditions. So pap smear is considered a screening test when you have no symptoms. Mm-hmm. Or a colonoscopy is a screening test if you have no GI bleed, no abdominal pain. So screening means you're at risk uh, of, of getting a cervical cancer, rectal, uh, colorectal cancer, in this case, out being, uh, having alcohol use disorder issues. Um, so you're at risk. So you wouldn't give this to a 12-year-old who's, who, who doesn't drink. So we give it to people who are, are at risk. These are adults uh, and uh, and uh, and they can quantify, quantitatively, turn words into numbers, uh, quantify kind of our risk, uh, and t- give us a hint that maybe we are have problem drinking or maybe we're safer than we thought. Mm, mm. So we've got the one that we're looking at here is called the audit, um, mm-hmm. which is published by the World Health Organization. Mm-hmm. or It's developed by the World Health Organization. We're going to link this one in the description as well. Um, it is a 10 question self administered uh, screening that asks questions about frequency of drinking, how many drinks, mm-hmm. um, what kind of like other symptoms that you might have if you've tried to stop or if you're drinking heavily, anything like that. Um, and th- there are resources all over the internet to do these self screenings as well, too. So it might be a useful starting place um, for people. And right. then, of course, um, there is treatment for alcohol use disorders available all over the place. That's right. Including if you don't have insurance. That's correct. Um, a great place to start if you do have insurance is with your insurance company. Many many insurance companies are so interested in, pre- in preventing the more serious medical care costs that can come from Absolutely. Um, you know, liver diseases and, and heart attacks and strokes that might come from alcoholism, that mm-hmm. they have lots of free resources available for smoking cessation as along with you know, uh, help with other addictions. Yes, uh, oftentimes there's carve outs or pieces of mental health that are carved out of your, of your overall medical bill or medical uh, mm-hmm. uh, premium. And, it's, and they specifically will say on your insurance card or whenever you call the, the, the patient representative, uh, if, you, if you ask for mental health or alcohol-related uh, uh, treatment uh, centers, they'll send you to ones that are covered by the, your plan. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there are also good resources for what's free and available in the area. You can go to your city's Department of Mental Health website. So the city of St. Louis mm-hmm. County has one. The state of Missouri has a Department of Mental Health as well. All mm-hmm. of those have great listings for um, uh, addiction and alcohol treatments as well. That's right. Um, okay. So I think to, to sort of recap, like what we want people to take away from this, what I'm going to take away from this, certainly, Mm -hmm. um, I see a need for there to be a recalibration, like a resetting of how we measure when to drink and how much to drink. Mm -hmm. So I think, an easy way for us to do that is just to pick, you know, pick pick an occasion where you would normally have something to drink mm-hmm. and choose not to have a drink at that time. And check in with yourself. How do you feel? Are you are you missing it? Do you do you wish you could partake? Are you just fine without it? Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think that's a, a, a good way to go about it. And then sort of see if you can string together a few more occasions that you would normally drink at and see, you know, observe the changes in your body. Do you feel clear or headed? Do you feel like your mood's improved? Do you feel like your sleep is improved? Mm-hmm. Um, you can certainly notice those things pretty quickly. By the way, uh, you will have strong, strong social signals to drink. Oh, for sure. Uh, mm-hmm. So if everybody else is drinking, in fact, the rule, the general principle is that if you're not drinking and people notice, yeah, they they're going to ask. They'll, they'll ask why. Right? Are you pregnant? Yep. Is, are you, you know, some people have to lie and say, Doctor Tatters, they pick the doctor, told me I can't with yeah. my new me- with my new medicines. Right. So they put the blame, which is fine, put the blame on me or that because I told them yeah. that they need to cut back or cut it out. You know, there is a lot of social pressure to drink, but it's also kind of in the last couple of years, there's sort of a trend of sobriety now too, right. that it's becoming more acceptable to have. To not drink for any yeah. reason, but also to have their mocktails. Yeah. There are lots of Virgin other drinks. options out right. there. So you can still enjoy a fun drink when you're out with people or wanting to celebrate a special occasion. That's right. That doesn't necessarily have to have alcohol in it. Right. Um, and then, of course, another thing, too, is just to be more observant of and exact about how, how much you're drinking. So 
maybe the next time you go and get a pint at a beer or at, at a bar, you can look at that beer and think to yourself, wow, this is normally I would think this is one drink, but this is actually probably one, one and a half or two drinks because of how big this glass is and how much alcohol I know is in here. Right. So maybe I'm going to have fewer of these tonight. At, at home, this is for Weight Watchers. At home, yeah. you, know, you know, re-measure. Yeah. Pour, pour yourself the normal, what you would pour or what you would drink <laughs> and measure it. Measure it into a, a calibrated container. And, you know, whether, uh, and that's, that's, it's very helpful to understand. It's like you, you eyeballed your, your, your one shot. And then when you, before, you know, uh, before you add the ice and stuff like that, uh, yeah. you know, uh, check it out and pour it out and see Absolutely. how much volume. And I like the comparison to, to Weight Watchers. Like, it's just like watching your calories right. or food and your portions size your eyes trick you Always. your eyes trick you you think it's less than it actually is you think that ice cream scoop is smaller than it actually <laughs> is so me- measuring can really really go a long way i uh i uh, it's um uh... People who have family members who are, uh, who are have addiction uh, issues, and then just not alcohol, but any other with this, you know, uh, uh, nicotine or mm-hmm. cocaine, uh, are at risk for uh, not just the same addictions as the parents, but other addictions. So kind of addictive. It's not really a personality, but uh, addictive addictive tendencies. And sometimes addictions fall under the OCD. Also, we talk mm-hmm. about depression, anxiety, but these are obsessive uh, people that they uh, they have they have uh, a hard time. Uh, with an off switch they have yeah. they have no governor yeah. on their they don't have a braking system where they can slow down right. they say i'm gonna just have two and then go to you know, iced tea they just can't once they have one it's like well one's not enough and two's too many sure uh so the idea is that that they they they, they say well i you know i need to wake up tomorrow morning but all of a sudden they're you know six drinks in yeah and uh and they've you know so if you're the one that's deciding for yourself that you can't uh, that you need to slow down um and you can that's great but then you say, well, and this is, you know, you know, whatever, dry, you know, whatever, January, dry January, whatever, mm, the, the, mm. you know, part of it is that people are trying to prove to themselves, but part of it is good for you if you're able to stop for a whole month. But if you're, 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 you're white knuckling it, you're clenching, you're, you're, you're by, you know, you're hanging on by your fingernails waiting for your ability to start drinking again. That might be a sign right there as, as, uh, as Vanessa said, yeah. that, uh, that, uh, that it uh, means a lot more to you mentally or physically than, than you realize. Yeah, Absolutely. And if you find yourself in that camp, reach out for help. You know, starting that conversation with your primary care physician Mm -hmm. is a really, really great first step. Yes. Um, Your primary care physician has a lot of interest in you remaining healthy and also in helping you to control any behaviors that might affect your health. There are certain medicines that are help decrease cravings. Mm. Uh, there are certain uh, there are a few for people who have severe severe issues. Uh, there uh, you know there's a Vivitrol, a, a shot of uh, an Altrexone shot monthly. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, there's a, a, a Campost, uh, a, a Camprel. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, there's a Disulfiram. It's an old one. It's an aversion therapy. Uh, so there are a couple. There's some things that are not FDA approved, like uh, uh, toperamate, topamax, that can help sometimes with uh, not just quitting, but uh, not so much quitting, but preventing you from relapsing. Yeah. Help decrease the cravings, etc. Plus treating the underlying trauma yeah. or depression or whatever. That's an enormous, enormous, enormous. Get your bit, therapy bit, bit. in. Yeah, and it's hard to. A lot of physicians or psychiatrists won't, won't treat your depression, and anxiety until they you're off whatever mm. substance because mm. you're masking the true depth of sure. your anxiety or yeah. depression by your by by self medication so some people say you know, i'll see you in two weeks or whatever a month or horrible uh you know let you need to be off blah 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 before i treat you for your depression or add mm. or whatever it is yeah yeah that's intense so i mean yeah we want to end on a hopeful note as we Absolutely. as we always do there is lots of help out, out there and of course you know we're we're talking about a very culturally accepted practice mm-hmm. that we just need to re-examine Sorry, this is it's not, not going like away. yeah it's not going away and this isn't like a uh, i don't know it's not like all of a sudden we're you know everybody in society has accepted heroin as the way we just celebrate things and stuff this is Alcohol can be sinister, it can be damaging, mm-hmm. but it's very much within our control to think about it differently, to That's use right. it differently, um, and have and let it play a different role in our lives. And we hope that people will decide to be more observant, more intentional. Yes. And drink Plus, less, ultimately. We, we can make another couple of podcasts. Uh, yeah. Please let us know. Um, we're happy to, 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 to take questions and take for instances and examples. Uh, you know, it's easier sometimes to talk about specifics about somebody's issues than it is to 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 kind of spout off for an hour about um, what what the what 
our experiences taking care of people uh, with mental health and alcohol Absolutely. issues. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Please, please, please. If you have any questions or want to add anything to the podcast, you can always get to us on our email address. It is not your doc pod at gmail.com. That is not your doc pod at gmail.com. Ooh, this is a good one, Dr. Tadros. They're all good. They're all good. They're all <laughs> yes. good. No, this is very important. Yeah. This is, uh, there's, I don't, I can't think of a family that whether, you know, that, that is not impacted yeah. directly or indirectly. And I can't think of, like, I, I am, I am this person. I like my IPA. Mm-hmm. I like my sours. I like mm-hmm. my good stuff. Yes. But I can be more intentional and I can be more aware of the consequences of drinking alcohol. Enjoy it in good and health. I will. Enjoy it in good health. Yeah, there we go. All right, thanks, guys. We'll be back again. Bye-bye. This previous podcast represents my opinions and the opinions of my guests. This is not medical advice, and I'm not establishing a physician-patient relationship with any listener. The content here should not be taken as medical advice. The content here is for informational purposes only, and because each patient is so unique, please consult your healthcare professional for any medical questions that you may have.